Uh, welcome, everybody. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, take this opportunity to uh, welcome our speaker. We are extremely honored and extremely lucky to have Professor Peter Gregory here with us. Uh, Jill Kerr Conway, Professor Emeritus of Religion and East Asian Studies from Smith College. Um, really, um, for anyone studying Chinese Buddhism, particularly Chinese Buddhist thought, um, one of the definers of the field uh, for us here in North America in the English language, and I'd say in the world, uh, the world expert on the thought of Zongmi, his two books, uh, Zongmi and the Signification of Chinese Buddhism, and uh, the annotated translation of Zongmi's Yuanren Lun, uh, Inquiry into the Origin of Humanity. Uh, classic works in the field. I think everyone who works on Chinese Buddhism knows these things backwards and forwards. Also, one of the um, uh, first uh, uh, kind of uh, opening shots in attempting to make sense of the Chinese Buddhist neo-Confucian relationships, which, uh, again, there's very little to even be placed next to Professor Gregory's work even now in those fields. I'm hoping some of the people in this room uh, we'll continue that work. We're uh, trying to make some of that possible, but uh, it's a long way to go, and it's a very high bar that has been set by Professor Gregory. Um, so without further ado, I will um, yield the podium. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Peter Gregory. Um, thank you all for coming, and uh, my thanks and gratitude to the Martin Marty Center for sponsoring this event, and to Professor Zaporin for um, extending the invitation for me this year to speak here, and uh, and to Paul Kopp for lending me his power cord. Uh, <laughs> I always forget the one thing when I travel. Um, I mean, I say this as a rule now in my life so that when I forget something, I don't get mad at myself any longer. And, of course, what that was on this trip was my power cord. Um, I'm going to read the paper today, and I say that sort of with, with, with a note of apology. I don't like to read papers, and I don't like people to read papers at me. But, um, but it's a pretty tightly... It's a pretty tightly organized talk, and what I'm going to really be talking about um, is a translation that I've been working on for uh, for many years, and I really want to kind of work through that with you. So those those of you that can kind of read along with the uh, Chinese, uh, any comments or uh, questions you have on on the translation, or just those of you who you know have a feeling for the English or problems in the English, um, I'd really be grateful for. Uh, feedback on that. Um, and um, so to make things a little easier for you to follow, I've got, um, I've got, I've got um, PowerPoint up here which will uh, have the passages that I'm talking about. So as I read them, you can kind of follow along. Um, those of you sitting in the back, um, if any of you have eyes like mine, um, you might want to move up a little closer so you can see. Um, and uh, those of you who have young eyes, you don't have to bother, but um, okay. <clears throat> I want to use, use the occasion today uh, to reflect on some ideas that I've been mulling over um, in a text that I began to work on again after a long hiatus of almost a decade. Uh, I began working on an annotated translation to Zongmi's uh, comprehensive preface to the collected writings on the source of Chan on a sabbatical during the 2006-07 um, academic year. Although I managed in getting a draft of about 85% of the text done that year, um, I never had a sustained period of time um, to work on it until this past spring uh, when I had a welcome opportunity uh, to teach the text to a graduate seminar at Stanford. 
Um, and <clears throat> it's a very interesting experience, sort of coming back to something you haven't worked on for almost a decade. Um, it was... Um, it really hit me in a way that it hadn't before. Um, that oh, what a really impressive text this is. The the, the scope of Dongmi's erudition and the thoroughgoing coherence and consistency with which he kind of wrought his edifice in this text. Um, so in this paper, um, I want to focus on a particular passage of that text, and I'm hoping to be able to give. Is the mic okay? I'm getting a little, okay. And I'm hoping to be able to use a deep reading of it to illuminate some of the larger contours of the text as a whole, as well as the nature and scope of Zongmi's project in writing it. Zongmi's preface claims to be a comprehensive introduction to a collection of the writings of the different Chan traditions that would have been known to him at the beginning of the fourth decade of the ninth century when he wrote this work as he defines the scope and contents of his compilation. I got it up there, yeah. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in, the opening, in the opening sentence. Um, I have titled this work, Collected Writings on the Source of Chan, because it records the prose and verse that express the fundamental principles of, Ch of the Chan approach as related by the various traditions which I have collected together into a single compilation in order to pass down to later generations. We might, let's see, how do I do this? Just push this one, right? How do I click over? Yeah, probably. Um, just, just hit the button here, yeah. okay. Okay. <clears throat> We might pause here for a moment um, to note that Zongmi refers to this collection as a special Chan uh, pitaka. Elsewhere in the text, um, and this is what we'll be looking at in the reading class um, tomorrow, for those of you who might come to that. Um, elsewhere in the text, he advances a novel his historical theory. Uh, he claims that originally there was a Chan pitaka, um, together with those of the Vinaya and what he calls the Dharma. Um, the Dharma comprises scriptures and treatises, thereby conflating into one what in the standard formulation of the Tripitaka were those of Sutra and Abhidharma. Whereas the other two Pitaka were textual repositories, the <clears throat> Chan Pitaka transmitted the mind of the Buddha. In the beginning, all three were passed down together, and the first five patriarchs had an equal command of each. After Upagupta, however, the Sangha divided into three Vinaya traditions, or excuse me, five Vinaya traditions, or the five Nikaya. Um, and the transmission of the Vinaya teachings became split off from Chan <clears throat> on the one hand, and the textual tradition on the other. The textual tradition in Chan continued to be transmitted together down until the 23rd patriarch, Sima Bhikshu, after which they were transmitted separately. Zongmi's compilation thus seeks to reunite the study of the canonical textual tradition of sutras and treatises with the practice of Chan. Although the details of his argument here are idiosyncratic and may at first blush even seem quixotic to us. They reveal an anxiety about rupture and conflict and the psychological need to make a sundered tradition whole again. This underlying sense of discomfort pervades his work as a whole and is reflected in the various strategies he devises to deal with it. Okay. Zongmi lived during the late 8th and early 9th century, and he was deeply involved with both the Chan and Huayan traditions of Buddhism. He's probably best known as someone who sought to harmonize the doctrinal teachings of different philosophical schools, such as Huayan, 
with the different traditions of Chan prevalent in his day, as instantiated in the divide between textualists and meditators. His text creatively adapts Huayan thought to provide a philosophical framework in which to reconcile the major shifts, the major rifts that he perceived to divide the Chinese Buddhist world of his time. There are three fault lines <clears throat> around which these rifts occur. The first, and for him the most significant, is that which divided textual scholars from Chan practitioners. The second pitted members <clears throat> of different Chan traditions against one another. And the third separated textual scholars into contending philosophical traditions such as Majamaka and Yoga Chara. Each of these rifts is dealt with in a separate section of the text. This takes about half of this text is with these different rifts and how they, how they play out. And it's only attempts to um, find a unifying framework to understand them. Songmi describes the problem as a situation in which <clears throat> advocates of different positions adamantly adhere to their own conviction with each taking itself to be the party in the right while criticizing the others as wrong. Um, it is therefore necessary to unify them together into, single, into a single whole so as to make them all perfectly concordant. As he explains, <clears throat> people often form conflicting attachments in accord with their emotionally charged views. And once their attachments are formed, they come into conflict with one another. The Dharma, however, originally pervades everything in accord with the truth. And since it pervades everything, it is concordant with everything. Putting in terms of what is most essential, he concludes, I would say that when taken in isolation, each of them is wrong, but when taken together, each of them is true. This statement neatly encapsulates the approach that Tsongmi adopts throughout the preface to find a larger whole in which various seemingly discrepant parts uh, can be united. Um, I put up here just a a very uh, truncated and brief sort of outline of the four main sections of the text and sort of the where things fall within it. Um, and I just, for those of you who are reading Buddhist texts together, um, I guess one of the things that's really, uh, the more I've worked on this particular text and other texts um, that I've come to appreciate is, is how, how important it is um, to have a kind of comprehensive text as a whole, and in reading any given passage to see where that passage fits in terms of the integrity of the text as a whole. Otherwise, you don't know how to read it, um, or at least in, that's my particular approach. Um, okay. <clears throat> the section that I want to focus on today is worth our attention for several reasons. First, it occurs at a place in the text that signals its importance. It is found close to the beginning in the section where Tsongmi explains his main overarching reason for assembling his collection, and this is clearly something that we should take seriously um, if we're to try to understand what he's trying to say in this work. Second, it's a passage that so far has not received much, if any, attention. Third, it is especially interesting because in it, Tsongmi gives an account of what might be called an enlightenment experience that he had. This is not the kind of thing that one normally expects to find in, Chan, in Tang Dynasty exegetical or Chan writings. Uh, not only does such a first-person account make it interesting in and of itself, but it is also particularly noteworthy as providing the basis on which Tsongmi claims unique authority to be able to resolve the central problem that the text addresses, to bridge the gap between textualists and meditators so as to make the tradition whole again. Although this section forms a tightly knit unit, I'll break my discussion of it into seven passages for easy presentation. Okay. 
So let's begin with the let's begin with the opening passage. Um, actually, the the blue background of things are all the signals to you that this is the actual text that I'm translating here. Um, it only begins. Uh, the Buddha taught the sudden and gradual teachings, and Chan developed the sudden and gradual approaches. The two teachings and the two approaches intermesh with each other. Nowadays, exegetes one-sidedly advocate the gradual doctrine, while Chan adepts one-sidedly promote the sudden principle. When the two encounter each other, the gulf is like that between southern and northern barbarians. This passage sets forth the basic problem that Sungmi addresses, the gulf that separates exegetes and Chan adepts into contending camps, a gulf so wide that as if they don't even speak the same language. Moreover, it suggests that what underlies this gulf is each camp's one-sided adherence to its particular point of view. As he will make clear in the final passage that we'll look at today, each side suffers from a different kind of imbalance. Textualists are prone to the error of emphasizing the cultivation of wisdom to the neglect of concentration, while meditators are prone to the error of emphasizing the cultivation of con- concentration to the neglect of wisdom. Whereas the one-sided cultivation of concentration increases ignorance, the one-sided cultivation of wisdom increases pernicious views. Um, These two terms, sudden and gradual, were categories that figured large in medieval Chinese Buddhist discussions of how best to classify the different teachings the Buddha was believed to have given. Such taxonomies helped to make sense out of what must seem like a confusing welter of disparate and sometimes even contradictory teachings by classifying them within a hierarchically organized framework in which each teaching could be put in its place. At the same time, these taxonomies also served to prioritize different teachings over one another, thus furnishing different schools a basis for claiming superiority over the others. Such classificatory schemes were a defining characteristic of medieval Chinese exegetical and philosophical schools and were a primary field of contention among their proponents. These two terms not only pertain to the classification of Buddhist doctrines, they also apply to the practice of meditation and the realization of awakening. They thus played a critical role in the formation of the Chan tradition in the 8th century, when different groups came to be defined by the stances that they held in regard to the nature of awakening and the means of its realization. Uh, In either case, these terms came to function polemically much as did Mahayana and Hinayana. Sudden and gradual are thus points of contention among one textual scholars in the debates over the classification of Buddhist teachings, Chan practitioners, two, Chan practitioners in their controversy over the nature of awakening and the means of its attainment, and three, more broadly between exegetes and Chan adepts. The major portion of the preface is devoted to clarifying the different contexts in which these terms operated in Chinese Buddhist discourse. Again, this takes up a major part of the the text as a whole. Okay, let's take a, let's go on to the second part of this passage. I, Zongmi, do not know what I could have done in my past life to condition my mind to be the way it was, wanting to free others from bondage when I had not yet liberated myself. I was neglecting my life for the Dharma and cutting off my spirituality out of pity for others. And then he goes on and adds in the interlinear note, uh, even though I knew that the Vimalakirti Sutra said, It is not possible to free another from bondage if one is still bound. When I look into why, I couldn't stop trying to do so, even if I had wanted to. 
It is because the conditioning from my past life was difficult to alter. The first thing to note um, is that Sungmi begins this passage by using his own name. This is an important, this, this is quite unusual. Um, this, is, this is an important move signaling that he is shifting into an autobiographical voice. Um, it is especially noteworthy in that it is the only place in the text in which he does so. In what follows, he offers a narrative that explains why he left the capital of Chang'an for his retreat in the Jungnan Mountains and describes the experience that he had there of a deepened understanding that established the basis for his claim to be able to speak authoritatively as the person who was uniquely qualified to moderate between the contending camps of exegetes and Chan adepts. <clears throat> the quote from the Vimalakirti is put in the mouth of the Buddha. And it occurs as a conclusion to a passage that is key to understanding what follows, a passage that Tsongmi could well expect his readership to be familiar with. It thus activates a whole associational field that affects the way the passages to follow are read. It is therefore worth quoting in full here. It occurs within a broader discussion of the relationship between emptiness and compassion. Um, this is one of my favorite passages in the Vimala Kirti. Those of you who ever have an occasion to teach this text to undergraduates, you can kind of pull them out of the air of um, abstraction with the concreteness of the problem that he's talking with here. It's a wonderful kind of teaching point for you, you can use in your classes. Anyway, here's the quote, here's the passage from the, the text. Um, the sick bodhisattva should further give rise to the thought just as my sickness is unreal and non-existent, so the sicknesses of all beings are unreal and non-existent. When he contemplates in this way, if he gives rise to great compassion coming from aff affective views in regard to beings, he should get rid of it at once. Why? Whoops. Okay. Why? Because the bodhisattva must cut off all adventitious defilements in giving rise to great compassion. If he has a compassion that comes from affective views, then he will have a mind that will become exhausted within birth and death. If he is able to rid himself of this, then he will be without exhaustion, and wherever he is born, he will not be beset by affective views. Being born without bondage, he will be able to preach the Dharma to sentient beings, freeing them from their bonds. Okay, and then it's following this that we have the words spoken by the Buddha quoted earlier by Tsongmi. Um, the Vimala Kirti passage intimates the themes of disease, the sickness of the bodhisattva, great compassion, and a misguided compassion that is driven by affective views and that leads to spiritual exhaustion, what we might call bodhisattva burnout, right, or compassion fatigue, um, all of which weave through and underlie the reading of what follows, creating an associational field that resonates in the mind of the reader, giving the section an underlying coherence not found in the written words alone. Zongmi's reference to his past life in both the opening sentence as well as the end of his interlinear note ties these themes from the Vimalakirti together with that of karma, especially the difficulty of overcoming the subtle effects of its persistence from past lives, a theme to which he returns in the sixth passage below. What I have translated as, I couldn't stop trying to do so, even if I had wanted to, in Zungmi's interlinear note, is a quote from the Confucian Analects, which is spoken by Confucius's favorite disciple, Yan Hui, expressing his admiration for the lofty character of the master's teaching that he couldn't give up trying to realize in his life, despite the daunting character of the task. 
the quote not only tells us something about Zhongli's classical education, uh, but it also tells us something about the readership he is addressing. Not altogether unsurprisingly, Zhongli uses the quote to a different purpose, which I would take to be that even if he had wanted to, he couldn't stop trying to liberate others before himself, before he himself was liberated, due to the subtle persistence of affective views from his past life that beset his compassion. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the next passage. Um, I've always lamented the discrepancy between human views and the Dharma when the Dharma becomes a disease to people. I have thus separately composed commentaries on sutras, vinaya, and treatises, the open wide, the gate of morality, concentration and wisdom, to clarify the principle that sudden insight must be supplemented by gradual cultivation, and to verify that what the Chan masters teach coincides with the Buddha's intent. This passage steps back to take a broader, broader view of the meaning of, it, of disease as the rationale for Tsungmi's project of reconciliation. In the following subsection, dealing s- ten specific reasons that Chan pr- practitioners should study scriptures and treatises, Tsungmi begins the first by saying, just, Do I have this here? Okay, I don't have this here. Uh, First by saying, the scriptures are the Buddha's words, and Chan is the Buddha's intent. What the Buddha's thought and said cannot contradict each other. He begins the present passage with the word Tan, to lament, the word with which Yen Wei begins his comments in the passage from the Analects quoted above an association that would not have been lost in an important segment of his readership. The passage picks up on the theme of disease, implicitly suggesting, suggested by the quotation from the Vimalakirti in the previous passage. Tsungmi understands disease to mean a biased grasp of the Dharma. Later in the text, he defines disease as adapting the Dharma to human views or human purposes. The opposition that Tsungmi draws here between human views and the Dharma recalls an off-sighted injunction attributed to the Buddha that after his nirvana, his followers should rely on the, on the Dharma rather than human authority, the first of the so-called four reliances. Tsungmi writes that grasping the Dharma in terms of human views is a disease that leads to discord. Only when human views are understood from the perspective of the Dharma will there be concord. By implication, both the one-sided views to which exegetes and Chan adepts adhere are symptoms of such disease. A brief words in order um, about Tsongmi's mention of the commentaries that that he had written before um, writing his preface. Uh, In addition to those uh, on the scripture of Perfect Awakening, for which he's best known. Um, he had composed commentaries to the Diamond Sutra, the Nirvana Sutra, the Vinaya, and Xuanzang's treatise on establishing consciousness only, to mention only the most salient uh, examples. Sungmi's mention of the principle that sudden insight must be supplemented by gradual cultivation also merits comment. This is the position that he identifies with Shen Hui, from from whom he traces his own lineage, and that he assigns to the highest form of Chan, that of the Hutzah tradition, which he correlates with the highest teaching of the Buddha, that which directly reveals that the true mind is the nature. It is the position for which Songmi is best known. For him, it represents the model for how Chan controversies over how sudden and gradual applied to cultivation and realization could best be resolved. It held that the path of spiritual development could be understood in terms of three stages. First, 
beginning with a sudden insight into the nature of the mind, followed by an often lengthy period of gradual cultivation in which that insight became integrated and deepened, and third, culminating in a final stage of full realization. It also provides a practice model that integrates meditative insight and textual study. As one's sudden insight is tested and deepened in the gradual cultivation that follows, a a gradual cultivation here would include study of of Buddhist text, of course. Uh, uh, Insight that's tested and deepened in the gradual cultivation that follows so that one may become an effective teacher by enabling one to broaden one's experience and increase one's skill so that one can use one's understanding to gather beings into the fold, to answer their questions, and to instruct them. Okay, let's sort of, let's move on to the fourth passage. Um, Tsongmi writes, even though the Buddha's intent is laid out in detail throughout the canon, the sheer vastness of its, of its, the sheer vastness of its text makes it difficult to fathom. Though careless scholars are numerous, those of resolute purpose are few, becoming, either, becoming even further entangled in names and forms. How could they ever distinguish gold from brass? They weary themselves out in vain before they can discover, discover what resonates with their spiritual capacity. The fourth passage um, addresses the difficulties and dangers of navigating the vast scope of the canonical text without the authoritative spiritual compass provided by a Chan master. Um, The first sentence recalls a similar complaint that Tsungmi had voiced in regard to the Avatamsaka and the preferability of the scripture of perfect awakening. Remember, he's a fifth patriarch in the Hawaiian tradition. This is a pretty remarkable thing to be saying for him. Uh, If you want to propagate the truth, single out its quintessence, and thoroughly penetrate the ultimate meaning, do not revere the Avatamsaka above all others. Ancient and modern worthies and masters of the Tripitaka and both the Western regions in this land have all classified it as supreme. Yet, its principles become so confused within its voluminous size that beginners become distraught and have difficulty entering into it. It is not as good as this scripture, the perfect awakening, uh, whose single fascicle can be entered immediately. Uh, This is one of his definitions of sudden. Um, As Songmi states elsewhere, it is the pointedness of Chan's sayings that distinctly distill the Buddha's intent that make them particularly useful given the difficulties of determining the Buddha's intent when faced with the vast scale of scriptures and treatises bequeathed by the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Gold here stands for the Dharma. Um, it It is not only an entirely different substance than brass, Uh, but it is also unalloyed and hence pure and unadulterated, whereas brass is an alloy of copper and zinc and hence tainted and admixed. Okay, so fifth fifth passage here. Um, Although the Buddha taught that practice consists in increasing compassion, worried that my affective views were too difficult to resist, I abandoned the crowd and entered the mountains to practice making my concentration equal to my wisdom. In my early and later periods of putting a stop to my worries, total 10 years altogether. And he goes on to explain that in his interlinear note. Uh, Early and later refer to the fact that during that time, I was summoned back to court by imperial command. And after dwelling in the capital for two years, I petitioned requesting to return to the mountains. This passage returns to themes alluded to earlier in the quote from the Vimalakirti. The practice of increasing compassion 
with which it begins has to do with putting the liberations of others before one's own, and hence recalls the Buddha's words quoted above. It also connects up with a theme touched on in third passage above in which Sungmi laments how the Dharma can become a disease by causing people to neglect their own physical and spiritual well-being out of a sense of misguided compassion. It is a difficulty of overcoming such affective views amidst the demands of life in Chang'an that led Tsongmi to decide to abandon the crowd, to enter the mountains, in order to make his concentration equal to his wisdom. Tsongmi's brief chronological comment provides a good place to fill in a little more about what we know about his activities during this period of his life, which, as the interlinear note suggests, can be divided into three phases. Um, the first, this is like this is his graduate study, right? In some sense, uh, as you'll, as you'll, I think this will resonate with you guys. Um, the first phase covers his stay in the Jungnan Mountains from the first lunar month of 821 until the fall of 828. During the course of the spring of 822 to the summer of 823, he finished his commentary to the Scripture of Perfect Awakening, the Yuanjueijing Dashu. Um, the culmination of a vow that he had made some 15 or more years earlier. He probably went on to compose his sub-commentary and a bridge commentary soon after that. He must have produced his massive ritual manual uh, for Kyohei. This is a manual that he that is based on Zongmi's, I mean on a jury's manual on the Lotus Sutra. Mm-hmm. Um, he must have produced his massive ritual manual on the treat for the cultivation and realization of the scripture of perfect awakening um, sometime in, the, in late um, 827 or the first half of 828. For he mentions that he practiced the particular repentance, solicitation, expression of sympathetic joy, dedication of merit, declaration of vows sequence found in the eighth fascicle of the text during the winter of 827. We should note that his writings up through the end of this period were scholastic and exegetical works aimed at a learned Buddhist audience in the form of commentaries, annotated outlines, summaries, study guides, and compilations of essential passages from key texts. Taken together, they represent a comprehensive mastery of a wide body of scriptures, treatises, and commentaries covering the major doctrinal traditions of this time. The second phase begins with his leaving the mountains for the imperial capital of Chang'an in the fall of 828 at the invitation to court by imperial edict. One Song, who had ascended the throne the previous year, had already attracted a number of luminaries to the court. Tsungmi congratulated the emperor on his birthday in the 10th lunar month. After questioning Tsungmi on the essentials of the Dharma, one song bestowed a purple robe on him and granted him the title Great Worthy. Tsungmi's two years in the capital were enormously significant ones in terms of both his own sense of personal accomplishment as well as the course of his subsequent tr- career. Uh, his presence in the court and the prestige that his imperially bestowed honors brought afforded him the opportunity to form a relationship with a number of important scholar officials um, with whom we know Tsongmi was later associated um, who were all present um, at the imperial capital during his stay there. Um, the recognition he received the court and the contact contacts that he made there must have instilled a new confidence in him. They must also have enlarged his sense of mission, for the character of his writings changes. His style becomes more literary, for one, reflecting his broadened audience. From this time on, he turns from primarily exegetical works aimed at a learned Buddhist audience to works of wider appeal. He moves beyond the confines of Buddhist scholastic concerns to address more encompassing intellectual issues, 
affecting Buddhism of his day. Most of these subsequent works, often in the form of well-polished essays or letters, were written in response to requests or specific questions from prominent scholar officials. Although in many ways his time at court must have seemed like a pinnacle in his life, Zongmi petitioned to return to the mountains, most likely leaving Chang'an in late 829 or early 830. I believe that it was his worries about getting too caught up in the busyness and demands of his life in the capital that precipitated what he, <clears throat> what he felt as the need to abandon the crowd, to enter the mountains in order to make his concentration equal to his wisdom. The third, the third phase covers his stay in the Jungnan Mountains until 832 or 833. I believe that it must have been during this time that Zongmi had the experience he recounts in the next passage. As the arising and perishing of my subtle residual feelings became clearer in calm wisdom, the array of the different meanings of the Dharma appeared in order before my empty mind, just as a ray of sunlight shining through a crack illumines the swirling motes of dust or the reflected images are bright and clear in the depths of a tranquil pool. This is the most intriguing passage in this section. It tantalizes us with the experience that it intimates yet does not fully disclose. It is extraordinarily well-crafted in the way in which it weaves together the associational resonances of textual allusions that that inform its meaning. It is also notable for its literary quality. We should note, for example, the the carefully constructed parallelism, how interiorly the arising and perishing of his subtle residual feelings becoming clear and calm wisdom is restated exteriorly in how a ray of sunlight shining through a a crack illumines swirling motes of dust and how interiorly the array of the different meanings of the Dharma that appeared in order before his empty mind is restated exteriorly in how reflected images are bright and clear in the depths of a tranquil pool. Note, too, how visual imagery, whether literal or metaphorical, is central to the meaning of each of the four statements that this passage comprises. One, becoming clear and calm wisdom. Two, appearing in his empty mind. Three, illumined by a ray of sunlight and four reflected images. In each case, the mode of apprehension is visual. Indeed, we could well characterize Zongmi's experience as a vision, or perhaps more accurately, an experience in which his vision of the Dharma and its meanings came together in his mind. Still, we don't know when it happened, whether it occurred as a moment in time, or as a gradual culmination of a long process, or whether something interior might have been triggered by something in his environment. The only way we have to get a fuller sense of what Zongmi might mean is to unpack the associations and illusions that underline and form the surface expression of his elusive and poetic words. Okay. I'd like to begin with the term calm wisdom, or more precisely, the wisdom born of calmness that Zongmi practices. The term is found in the seventh chapter of the Scripture of Perfect Awakening, where it occurs in an explanation of shamatha, the practice of calming and concentration. It seems to present a model for Zongmi's description of his experience in this passage. Um, so here's the passage from the uh, Yuan Jue Jing. If bodhisattvas realize pure, perfect awakening, and with their pure, awakened mind, take calming as their practice, then by letting their thoughts settle, they become aware of the agitation of consciousness. 
when the wisdom born of calmness becomes manifest, the appearance of body and mind as objects are accordingly extinguished forever. And then they are able internally to generate tranquility and composure. Because of this tranquility, the mind of the Tathagatas throughout the ten directions is revealed within them as an image in a mirror. This expedient method is called shamatha. Interesting definition of shamatha, huh? Anyway. As we saw in the previous passage, Zongmi states that he left the capital and returned to the mountains to make his concentration equal to his wisdom, which parallels the taking calm, taking calming as their practice in the passage just quoted uh, from the perfect awakening. This practice then, by allowing thoughts to settle, enables one to become aware of the agitation of consciousness a process that would seem to match closely his description of the arising and perishing of a subtle residual feelings becoming clear and calm wisdom, as exemplified by the swirling motes of dust illumined by a shaft of sunlight. The comparison suggests that by becoming aware of such residual, subtle residual feelings and the clarity of calmness, they become extinguished forever in the wisdom born of calmness. The array of the different meanings of the Dharma that appear in order before his empty mind then is the content of the wisdom that is born from the deepening of his practice of calmness. The word settle um, in the perfect awakening passage refers to the purifying of water by allowing the sediment to settle out, which suggests the imagery of the pond or pool that Tsongmi uses. The reflected images are bright and clear in the depths of a tranquil pool, remember. Um, through long association in Chinese Buddhist discussions of meditation, the image of a clear pond naturally implies that of a mirror, which is able to reflect all things clearly. In the Huayan exegetical tradition, for example, the Buddha's enlightened vision is symbolized by the samadhi of oceanic reflection, in which the harmonious interrelationship of all phenomena in the entire universe simultaneously appeared in his mind as as if reflected on a vast, tranquil ocean. The perfect awakening passage (laughs) closes with the mind of the Tathagatas throughout the ten directions being revealed within them as an image in a mirror. Okay. Having seen how the passage on calm awakening from the scripture of perfect enlightenment seems to provide a script for Tsongmi's account of his experience, we are now ready to turn our attention to the first words of the passage, subtle residual feelings. Um, These refer to the finest and most subtle dregs of defilement or klesha that remain to be eliminated before the realization of Buddhahood. To understand the significance that this experience has for Tsongmi, we must turn to the final section of the preface to see how it fits fits within the elaborate sociological scheme that he presents there. Um, Anyway, this, this... for those of you who can read the Chinese, this, this, is the, this is the part of the chart that appears in the Taisho edition of this, of this text, um, which shows, illustrates what I'm going to sort of explain, try to explain very, very briefly, if I can, um, the, 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 the structure of his soteriological scheme. Um, in many ways, Dongmi's scheme functions much like the traditional 12-link chain of conditioned origination, except that Tsongmi's scheme is articulated in Yogacara terms drawn from the awakening of faith. In both cases, understanding how the causal chain of conditions works serially in dependence on one another in the process by which the suffering of old age, sickness, and death arises provides a map by which the process can be reversed by working back through each link in the chain in reverse order. The key lies in the fact 
that because the process is causally conditioned, it is bidirectional. It can, e- it can either move with the flow of samsara, um, anuloma, or against the flow of samsara, pratiloma. It is only by understanding how the process of conditioning works that it can be reversed. Okay. Songmi's Song scheme has ten reciprocal stages in the process that leads to, leads to bondage and that which leads to liberation. He defines the first, um, conforming to the flow of birth and death, anuloma, as being deluded about what's true and following after what's false. It arises from the fine and subtle and moving in the direction of conforming to the flow of birth and death gives rise to successive stages of delusion and evolves towards the course. He defines the second, reversing the flow of birth and death, pratiloma, as realizing what's false and returning to what's true. It moves from the coarse and heavy in the reverse direction, cuts off successive stages of defilement, and evolves towards the subtle. The wisdom necessary to overturn the successive stages of delusion proceeds from the superficial to the profound. The coarse obstructions are easy to banish because a superficial wisdom is able to overturn them. The subtle delusions are difficult to eliminate because only a profound wisdom is able to cut them off. Reading Tsongmi's sixth passage in light of his description of the bidirectional process of conditioning, his, sudden, his subtle residual feelings would refer to the subtle delusions that are difficult to eliminate, which would correspond to the third of his ten stages um, in the process of the arising and development of delusion, which he calls, following the awakening of faith, the arising of thought. Um, This is the first subtle movement of thought, which initiates the process of phenomenal evolution by giving rise to the bifurcation of consciousness into subject and object. It is this split that the calm wisdom of the perfect awakening passage eliminates forever. It is overturned in the ninth of the ten stages in the process towards full awakening, which he calls freedom from thought. In this stage, one becomes fully aware of the ultimate origin of deluded thoughts and sees that the true nature of the mind is eternal. This is the stage of ultimate awakening, defined in the awakening of faith as becoming aware of the source of the mind. It counteracts the third stage in the process of delusion, that of the arising of thoughts, and it is the prelude to the tenth and final stage in Tsongmi's scheme, realizing Buddhahood. Okay. So, what does this tell us? Uh, locating Tsungmi's description of his experience within his own soteriological scheme, realize that it would be, although it would be presumptuous for him to claim so explicitly here, he is nevertheless implicitly assuming for himself a rather exalted stage of spiritual attainment, that of ultimate awakening, the penultimate stage to the realization of Buddhahood. Having eliminated the subtlest tracing of karmic residue that had vexed him, and having equalized his concentration of wisdom, he can now don the authority to mediate between exegetes and Chan adepts. What Somi means by uh, fa'i, which I have translated here as the Dharma and its meanings, begs further elucidation. Um, How to understand these two characters when they appear together um, sometimes is a pretty tricky business um, in reading any given passage. Uh, 
But there are several important sections in his preface where Tsung Mi makes an emphatic point about distinguishing between them. And I think that that's clearly how they're to be understood here. Probably the most important of these is found in the seventh of the ten specific reasons that he enumerates for why Chan adepts should study canonical texts. Because the Dharma and its meanings are not the same, it is necessary to skillfully distinguish between them. Um, as he explains, as a rule, if one wants to elucidate the nature and phenomenal appearances of all dharmas, one must first distinguish between the dharma and its meanings. If one understands the meanings and reliance on the dharma, the meanings will be clear. If one interprets the dharma in reliance on the meanings, then the dharma will be made evident. He illustrates the difference by comparing the dharma to gold and its meanings to the host of implements that can be fashioned out of it. Gold represents the dharma, and its unchanging and adapting to conditions represents its meanings. This section goes on to elaborate Tsung Mi's ontology of mind, which derives from the awakening of faith, which identifies the dharma with the mind of sentient beings, or the one mind. This mind has two meanings, or two modalities. Um, It is both what does not change and what adapts to conditions. While its nature does not change, in adapting to conditions, it gives rise to a multiplicity of phenomenal manifestations. He quotes the scripture of innumerable meanings, which says, the innumerable meanings are born from the one dharma. The dharma is thus one and immutable, while its various meanings are multiple and contingent. If this is what Tsung Mi has in mind, when he refers to the dharma and its meanings in this passage, then the vision that is arrayed in his empty mind is that of how the totality of the infinite multiplicity of all phenomena can be seen as manifestations of the one mind, as represented diagrammatically in the final section of his text. But the dharma, as distinct from the mind, can also refer to the corpus of canonical writings, as when Tsung Mi talks about the dharma pitaka, uh, that is, the collection of scriptures and treatises, as distinct from those of Vinaya or Chan, the latter of which transmits the Buddha's mind. In this case, its meanings can refer to the spectrum of interpretive positions put forth by various Buddhist exegetes or philosophers such as Bhava, Viveka, or Dharmapala. Hence, we could say for, <clears throat> that for Tsung Mi, although the Dharma is one, it is refracted through various interpretations. As we saw earlier, this only becomes a problem when these interpretive or philosophical positions are taken out of the context of the Dharma and held on to as absolutes. In such instances, such positions are a case of adapting the Dharma to human views, which we saw earlier Tsung Mi had used to exemplify the way in which the Dharma could become a disease to people. The passage is, is ambiguous enough to leave for either readings, that is, uh, the Dharma as mind or the Dharma as a textual corpus. Um, the two readings, of course, are not necessarily incompatible, at least for Tsung Mi, uh, for whom the Buddha's intent in preaching the Dharma was to reveal the mind. In either case, the underlying model provides a template for unifying the one into the many. Finally, uh, a brief comment on the term that I have translated as array. Uh, Lolie is an array that is ordered and structured. Furthermore, given that it is an ordered and structured array of the Dharma and its meanings, I would maintain that here it refers to the vision of the whole hierarchically reticulated architecture that we see evidence everywhere throughout Tsung Mi's pre- preface. 
we have no way of ever knowing what he might have actually experienced while practicing calm wisdom in his retreat in the Jungnan Mountains. But what is clear in the very architectonics of his preface itself is that there was a point at which his vision of how the entirety of Buddhism, with all its contending interpretations, fit together into a coherent whole, gelled in his mind. Okay, let's just move on quickly and just uh, finish up with the last passage here. Um, How can I moderate between the ignorant Chan adepts who cleave to the silence of emptiness and the unbalanced advocates of wisdom who are wholly given over to the investigation of texts? Still, because I have discerned the meaning of the teachings by perceiving my own mind, I have feelings of respect for the tradition that bases itself on mind. This, of course, is the Chan tradition. Moreover, because I've understood the cultivation of mind by discerning the teachings, I have reverent regard for the meaning of the teachings. my pages here turned around, sorry. Um, This passage um, begins by contrasting ignorant Chan adepts with unbalanced uh, advocates of wisdom. Unbalanced wisdom, Quang Hui. um, Is the error to which exegetes whose concentration is not yet firm are prone where is ignorant concentration, Yu Ding, is the error to which meditators whose wisdom is not yet deep are prone. In his explanatory note, gloss, Tsung Mi likens the word that I have translated as unbalanced, Quan, to a flame in the wind with a movement of waves on water, indicating that it lacks stability. This is a very hard word to know how to translate properly, but I hit on unbalanced in some sense in terms of this idea of lacking stability. Of course, one of the words for stability is ding, which is concentration. Um, He explains the two adjectives in question um, and the errors they represent in the following passage from his commentary in the scripture of Perfect Awakening. Lack of concentration and lack of wisdom, respectively, are characterized as guang and yu. Um, They are the ignorance and pernicious views that come from one-sidedly cultivating only one of these approaches. When these two are carried out together, they enable one to become the most honorable of two-legged creatures. Of course, the Buddha, right? Um, Actually, I was talking to Kyohei earlier, so I wasn't going to mention this, but I will. Um, this is this this actually this well, this passage that I'm just discussing comes from um, the Mohajigwan, which he goes on and cites um, later on in this long note. Um, re- returning to the passage at hand, the second sentence Zong, in the second sentence, Zongmi clarifies his qualification for being able to moderate between these two contending camps. He can bridge the gulf because he has both discerned the meaning of the teachings by perceiving his own mind and understood the cultivation of mind by discerning the teachings. Hence, he does not fall into either of the errors for which each side is, to which each side is prone. This passage calls to mind Tsungmi's coda to his massive sub-commentary to the scripture of awakening which I will take as the coda with which to end this talk as well. Um, this, is this, um, this is this passage I have up there. Uh, to use the teachings of the sage as a luminous mirror in which to see one's own mind reflected and to use one's own mind as a lamp of wisdom with which to illumine the profound meaning of the scriptures. To which he adds the following gloss. In the statement, the mirror of the Dharma illumines the mind. Dharma refers to the teachings, and the mirror is its illustration or simile. 
For example, people have no means to see their own ears or eyes, but if they use a mirror, they can see them reflected in it. The same holds for the nature of the mind of sentient beings. Although they have no minds to, they, although they have no means to see it by themselves, because they have heard the teachings of the sage, as soon as they make use of it to turn the illumination back, they will see. Insofar as any statement could ever be taken to encapsulate the project of a lifetime of scholarly and religious activity, and such a tremendously productive one at that, we might well take this coda to do so for Tong Mi. It certainly does so for his preface. So thank you for being such a kind and attentive audience. Uh, and I'm writing for this song, and, 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 and very well 
what she had done is by modern child pathologists and psychologists that we were in the history of the early child tradition, you know, with the discovery of the blood on the next steps. And so it says the only contemporary text, you know, witness, if you can call it that, you know, somebody who's on the ground and this is happening, this is the first text that tries to get a synopsis description of the child tradition, its origins, and its kind of, or what was thought to be a triangle. It's a pretty good triangle. But, you know, he's the first person to take a kind of overview of the child tradition. And the text of these texts that have a genealogical tree becomes the model in which the tradition comes to the top of its head. And it sort of goes on to a different point. But one of the things that I think is lacking in modern scholarship is, you know, he's been looked at a lot by scholars of charm, you know, who try to mine this for historical, you know, for its historical value in this project of rewriting the tradition. And in doing so, you know, they don't read the whole text. You know, they're just looking at, they're looking, you know, there's a significant amount of text that applies to this, but, you know, they don't take it, they don't see the integrity of the system in which this is placed. So I tend to emphasize more on the side of this. And, you know, part of my insistence is that people should be textual. People should preserve and respect the integrity of the text and not just pull out its pieces. But it's interesting what you said in the opinion. And one of the things, as I was working on this, one of the things that struck me, this occurs in lots of things. In his preface to both his commentary, which is then elaborated in detail in his sub-commentary, he gives a little more of a commentary. And again, these include the spiritual experiences. You know, his experience of encountering the scripture for the awakening for the first time. And the kind of trope, he dances for joy. And there's a correspondence with Tumwa. And later, in a text that he writes at the end of his life, Yvonne comes in, which he emphasizes his fear of poverty. And this is not for his father, but he gives him a performance against his father. He again gives him, you know, if you want to buy a lot of statements, then he'll say, ah, it's on me. Ah, it's on me. It's on me. And he says, ah, it's on me. The other thing I want to touch on here, but, and I haven't really done the, I haven't really done this, what, kind of systematic thinking through this and kind of, and supporting it, but it's only a slight bit of influence on this message. And I'm sorry, I felt a little bit about this. And I have both works, you know, very much, you know, particularly in some days when, you know, it's some kind of, you know, challenge, you know, away from the faith, interjection into its own people, into things like this course. But it's concerned that this balance, you know, is a concern that it's also the norms in all this, you know, when we talk about the balance and the concentration and all that kind of thing. This is kind of a bigger part now. My name is Phil Kahn. I work on voice art. So, you mentioned that in the very beginning, there's some confusion, some confusion text, for example, the NS were mentioned by... There's a four-character quote. Yeah, but actually, to me, it's that why this, because his dichotomy between the Chan meditation practice and the Jiang Zhe, the, 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 how do we say, the, like, super Christian school, reminds me of the 
Confucian uh, dichotomy of uh, Xue and Su. Study and, uh, and, and, and and think, especially as a, 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 a part of your presentation. So if you focus on Hui, it leads to a bad uh, result. If you focus only on being, it leads to a bad result. So, so when Kong talks about study and think, when you focus only on study, you get lost. When you focus on only on think, you get really exhausted. I, 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 I don't know. I just think. Uh, I just, I mean, it's not just a Buddhist quality. Right, right, right. There's, yeah. there's yeah. similarity between this and. This is uh, maybe I, I I don't know much about it. Maybe what? Maybe um. So we also know about that a little bit. Yeah. And also the, the selection of Zhong and Chinese is really interesting to me because if you want to really abandon the entire um, like this world and go to a mountain and study, you wouldn't choose Zhong and Chinese. Yeah. There are a lot of kind of mountains. You could choose away. If you want to get in the end of China, you know, there's a Cheng Yu, Zhong and Jie Jie. Zhong and Jie Jie is the fast track to get into the palace. You know, when you can really get successful in the civil, civil service van, you go to Zhong and Jie Jie, the emperor will pay attention to you. So, I was wondering why did Zhong and Jie Jie select Zhong and Jie Jie? In the beginning, maybe he was trying to get into China. Well, you know, there are many different ways you can, you can read the biography. Um, and, you know, it's depending on what you want to focus on. Um, I mean, one way, if, if we analyze Bowman's uh, biography in terms of a brilliant, you know, talented young man from Sichuan trying to make it in the capital, which is a legitimate reading of his biography, uh, clearly that's true. And, and, and the person who I didn't mention here is Chungwon, but Chungwon in his lifetime is probably the most esteemed British um, pilot in China. Um, I mean, hardly this would be over 100. <laughs> so he is, but uh, you know, he's just a man of enormous um, erudition, and you know, he's, he's, uh, he's, he's what, honored by three of the emperors, and uh, he has lots of literary connections. So this paves the way in some ways, for its own use, the entree into you know, Because a lot of these people who you meet then are connect, have connections with Chang. Um, so, I mean, if you look at, certainly, in, in, for 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 you know, Chang not isn't the Bumis. Um, I mean, Wang Wei has his retreat there, and during his poetry, it seems very, very rustic, but, you know, you see these paintings of it. It's uh, not quite so rustic. It's quite a well cooked little retreat. Um, so there's a lot going. There's a lot of life going on there. You know, different, uh, different kinds. But it is a, it is also a place of hermitage, you know, where um, the people. You know, so there's there are big monasteries, and monasteries with libraries, and part of them is going to be monastic libraries there. And the thing, and he spends years. He's there before this happens too. Um, you can think of this as his graduate stuff, right? He's going, he's, he's, you know, he says he's trying to reach the channel. And what he's doing, he's doing what you guys do, right? He's, he's, take, he's taking notes on text, he's making outlines, he's doing annotations, he's collecting all the great passages, you know, and this kind of stuff. Um, and then it sort of culminates in this commentary on the, you know, the, the, uh, the scripture of the That's his dissertation, you know? Um, it's really interesting, you know, it's sort of, and it's, you know, in some sense, you know, it's going to the, it's going to the um, court, it's like getting his first job, you know. Um, but he's clearly, you know, he's clearly, um, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to reduce his life just down to his male perspective, but he's certainly stupid, and he's open to, you know, the opportunities that open, open you know, open up for him. Um, but he doesn't seem to, um, you know, from from the sources that we have, which which don't tell us anywhere what we want to know in this regard, you know, he doesn't seem to, you know, really want to establish a temple for himself. That, that, that kind of power is, you know, it's, or you, you, you can also read his life as a kind of want to be official. You know, he went to a Confucian academy when he was young. And he was all taught by his family to take the exams. Uh, and when his father dies, he goes into a period of mourning. Uh, and since this time, you know, he's you know, kind of reflecting on his life, presumably thinking about issues of mortality, 
then it needs a child mark. And we decided to expose why we have right and not the Just, this will digress from your uh, very uh, wonderful and for me illuminating discussion, but um, taking off on the present exchange because it raises for me a more generalized problem in those studies, which is a kind of romanticism of the idea of the forest model, who sort of disappears way off into uh, the utter wilderness. And while I think that there have been certainly some cases of that, um, in looking at uh, elements of cultural geography and cultural history, I'm convinced that the greater mass of so-called forest monks and so forth actually lived in pretty close proximity to monastic and other centers where they did have access to libraries sure. um, and other facilities and patronage uh, and people who could supply um, their material needs. And so I think the trope of the forest monk and the monk in the wilderness is actually very often just that kind of trope. It's a kind of aesthetic um, that surrounds the idea of being being out of a noisy monastic community, being out of a, a you know, being in a place where you do have um, uh, something of a, a, a retreat, some isolation that gives you um, the ability to study, reflect, meditate um, in, in peace. But it's, it's not often the ideal of someone who really cuts themselves off from uh, the whole world of, uh, of social networks and, and, and connections. Yeah. No, no, really, I, I, that, that's a very important point of order that we're all taking. I, well, I agree with you, I agree with you on that. Uh, but what he does do is he doesn't, I would say, he doesn't necessarily cut himself off from this Yes, exactly. And, and what he has there is, is he has, he has, um, he has monastic libraries, which are very important to him. Uh, but he but also is a kind of tradition of hermitage, and, and he clearly, clearly, I, and I would take him at his word here, he clearly wants to have a place where he can devote more time to meditation practice. And one of the things that he does there, um, I work on this large ritual manual he, he wrote at one, at one point many, many years ago, and um, it's a text which is basically in cultures. Um, uh, a text that um, a jury writes on the practice of the Lotus Samadhi. He just replaces all those passages from the Lotus, Lotus Sutra with the arrangement thing. But the whole, the whole syntax, if you will, right? the whole syntax comes from Chen Tai and from the early, you know, whereas the vocabulary is divided uh, by the different part of the way. But it's another day of truth. Mm -hmm. uh, which involves, you know, a whole ritual cycle that's been repeated six times a day, three times a night, three times during the day. It probably takes at least two hours, two hours each time. It involves recitation of text, you know, uh, invocation of the Buddha, and so on so and so forth, dedication to merit. Um, and he does this for 90 days. And I remember reading a paper on this too. This is way in. You know, so he's he's still involved. I mean, and, that, and that's the beauty of it. He has he has the state, the, the paper is the support, uh, people you know feeding him, and uh, but he also has you know he has a distance from that much more kind of political world that allows him space for meditation for ritual practice. Perspective and the biographical elements 
people from Chicago and down the state. But, um, yeah. Uh, so it's, you know, it's really hard to have a trip. And people are just turned out of the law. You know, those problems. You know, because there are places where he's, he's, he's giving you an alternate position, like that of a doctor, where they use time. You can't, you know, I just decided to throw that out. You know, you've got to translate at least in a text like this, which is, you know, dealing with the different meanings of words and kind of set real, real uh, kind of critical sentences. You, know, you have to translate them into context. And, um, you know, you just can't, and this word, too, of course, that's like one of the most critical words in, in these texts, you know how to translate. Yeah. yeah, but also like the problem with the translation is that you say a couple of words with the term shanty itself, like whether it reappears throughout the text. No, I think that's, that's, I'm not, I can't say it 100% sure, but I think that's, um, yeah, I think it's maybe the end of the text. But it's certainly not going to occur all of it. And I just didn't know what to do with that word, you know. And so that's a case where my translation, or how I render that word, the same thing by the name of translation, right? And what fits in context of the number of words in context. But, you know, it's, um, and I'm sure if you ask, uh, if you would ask this in temporary, you would probably all of these different explanations of the word. And maybe part of it is just the fuzzy side, you know? Um, the lack of precise context. I was wondering if, uh, just to, on this, in your, when, when you use, when you explain Kaiyi as he was using it, whether I should think of it in terms of Dharma, Dharmata, or Vyanjana, uh, and um, it, another Dharma and the nature of, 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 of Dharma, uh, or Yes, an art of basically word and meaning. Um, well, I think, I think in this particular case, and this is a word because he discusses, and when he gets into the talking about the, um, the different, the more sort of the philosophical debates among the different, 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 different Buddhist traditions, you know, he gets into this kind of stuff in which they're, um, you know, that, and again, it's very, very hard to have a trend. I, I just stick with dark. That's easy to do. Yeah. But, but in, in, this, in, in this case, I mean, I think he's really going back to the sort of ontology of mind and the way of It means the one. Basically, means the one. Is it? But it, oh, it's but that character is used it in the awakening of faith. Yes. So they're they're they're, they're, they're okay. yeah. And then then the the e refer to the kind of um, the various uh, how do you translate this? These various gates, you know, or you know, okay. this sort of it's it, right. it's a kind of cosmological model really of a one that divides into two and so on and yeah. so forth. You know, so there's a kind of um, you know there's that structure on the mind. Just returning to the previous uh, remark, uh, um, there's a, a parallel that uh, in the Tibetan tradition uh, with the word uh, chakra, which generally translated as attachment. Um, it's either in the Chantirti's Nagantara or Nagarjuna's. Sureka, which in which the word generally connotes a fish or something attachment, something bad, is used as uh, a way to express affection for, for something. And in that case, particularly the unusual use of chakra is, is I think an echo of, of, of something found in Sutra. So it's in, in much the same way as when we hear is uh, quoting or confusion text. Or the, that, that's going to spark off lots of educated reader. And in the Tibetan context, the chakra also uh, brings to mind the sort of sutra and so forth. So I wonder if it just is a parallel, so it's almost a literary device of, of, that an author might employ 
that they're aware of the semantic feel that these words have. And these are like intention. They are. And at least, you know, kind of people who believe in its own meaning. But, you know, it's hard to imagine how these people had a whole, you know, maybe like these men today, you know, have just like huge database of texts that they never heard. And for Tony, you know, that started out with Confucian texts. And so what's interesting there is it's plugging into a different semantic field, you know, which is bringing in a different audience. And I think just that, those four little words, tell us something very, very important about who the audience is that he's addressing here. Um, you know, it's really, so that's why I would see this as, you know, um, yeah, I can imagine this text having been written before he's made the kind of connections that he makes when he goes to the capital and is honored by the emperor and, you know, rubbing shoulders and other guys. Um, but we can see it as, you know, kind of a one of these Confucian scholar. But he kind of projects that and goes back and, you know, um, Does that make any sense? I mean, this is so complicated. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I would like to know more about this for you. So you mentioned about the reversibility and bottom directionality of each area. And uh, it's very like a thing that would have been and uh, for X. Right? And so in that chart, also you see the beginning of the and the negative energy and the energy in Chinese parts. So that should be something added to that. So I don't know if it's uh, not straightforward Indian Buddhist uh, interpretation of non duality and all things, but something added from the interpretation for me of Chinese law. I'm not sure what law was added by something in this interpretation of non duality or reversibility. And I'm still not clear about the uh, what in what sense is uh, they are reversible? The most second question is uh, related to uh, Professor Kathleen Briggs about one mind. Can you, uh, in the interpretation of the one mind with two modalities, right. for example, like unchanging and conditional, then also like nature and form? So, in this one, is this one mind either ontologically or epistemologically in a privileged position uh, of things, or did this one might like, also be able to do No. Okay. It's not. It, it stands above it. It stands above that. Or below that. It didn't really work with this. Um, uh, uh, yeah, that's something that's it's a new one. Uh, and it's kind of present.
so that it turns the jack off off end the way the body is not a simple open simple answer. It's really pretty interesting. And you know, the last part of this text, um, there's a chart that we have. Yeah, it's the kind of thing. 
the expected result. But, you know, he doesn't, there isn't a unified Shah tradition. What we have is we have a series of different traditions, which all were different from one another. Many of them were probably different from one another. They were on the course of things in the city. So he describes three of the traditions that he's involved. Some of them are pretty radical. Some of them are pretty consultative. But there are, in the sense that you have, you know, China is not an institutional entity. They were not saying this all the time. You know, you do have certain traditions, like what comes to be called the Northern School, which is associated with certain monasteries and certain jobs. The East Mountain School is often referred to before some of the other things that happen. But, you know, it's still some of it in play. Tradition has to be challenged. You know, there is an overarching ideology. In some sense, he's creating an ideology in his book by seeing all these different schools. What these schools have in common is a claim to represent a transmission from India mediated by Bodhi Dharma. And so it's a little, it's almost, you know, it's a little early to talk about China in that sense. And, you know, what we value in that sense of the kind of school. And so these different traditions are very different from the rest. Some of them involve, you know, they claim some textual authority. Some of them reject the textual authority. And when he discusses the, you know, he uses this term, the Bodhinivas, to describe these houses. But he describes ten houses. And one of them is ten houses. So he's got, you know, he's got a broad idea of it. And it's sort of a free floating idea. It will mean different things in different parts of the text. And it's associated with the kind of, you know, it sort of comes up with, you know, three, three types of doubt. You know, we might call it the philosophical school of tradition. But I doubt it. It's sort of kind of qualified with the kind of that kind of thing that I'm focused on. And it's quite, you know, and it matches all the three schools of reading these traditions of China. You know, it's somewhat, I mean, it's certainly an artifact. It's not very artificial. And, you know, the different, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean that the practice is so different. So I don't know if that's how I can answer your question. I don't know if that's how I can answer your question. It's, you know, it's still very informative. You bring in a very, the kind of tradition that's still in a formative state. And it hasn't, it hasn't coalesced in terms of a unified, what we might call ideology. Because we certainly can call the ideology, the clear ideology, you know, something that there's no, there's no institution. And it's a claim to freedom. But there's lots of different meanings of all of those things. It's a claim. They're not unified as necessarily as a movement. Yeah. Following up on the clarity of charm and meditation and scholarship, just a couple of comments. Jumping to the song, the song in Sada, which you're going to talk exactly about this balance. And he must have read some of the, some of the, I don't know, the Greek writings. But he talks in his serene illumination exactly about that balance, that issue of balance. And then he talks about Prussia and Somalia, that they're one without the other is in balance. And in very similar terms to what you refer to in some of these. So that's much later. But to go back to some of these rough and fragmented contemporaries, the Tang masters, Tang masters, despite the slogan of going beyond words and letters and going directly to mind, 
all seem to quote scripture liberally. So in Dongshan, in Saddam's book, and even in supposedly iconoclast like Mahathir and Menji, many references to scripture go through. So it may be to show us the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, just to say that, that I don't know if there's ever a function of that strong of a vision. Except maybe when the Latin schools in this is why they don't do any ritual that they can, you know, they don't deserve any higher of the payment from the Taliban. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think the Taliban is one of the most important in the world. And that's the, you know, more probably more of a character in the world. Well, there are current Japanese art teachers who don't allow students to read the magazines or the copies of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know that. There's a certain rationale for certain points in the practice that you can justify it. But there's no law in the country. It's more high. I don't think so. Um, I think we have one more question. This is maybe the last one. Yeah. I'm very sure. By um, this talk, uh, the, the, the early slide about, about um, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the tax, the tax of the regular income from the beginning, being one side of this tragedy and the project to reconcile and
put it together that my comments in play was to synthesize the both traditions of meditation, meditation and Buddhism and ritual practice with um, doctrine and so on. So it clearly borrowed a lot, a lot of the same language clearly from that. Um, and you know, sort of ready to end the guy and you know, the sort of all that sort of stuff. But it's there in that tradition. And you know, if you read, if you read the person who may identify with the Shun, the Shun is pretty John Williams, if you might have said, but Shun, right? You know, and what we have are the records of Possible. Um, and you know, if you read those, some ways sort of brought up two different sociological models. Uh, but clearly, this model that it's only been used of, you know, sudden psychological period of small period of time practice, there's a record of the cost of the human and the simulation, so on and so forth. You know, that model is there in some way. It tends, it tends to be, it tends, it's not a lot of, the charm scholars tend to hide. They, you know, when they talk about charm in science, it's a direct cutting through, cutting through many threads of all the things that they say. But that, both that model, that model is there in terms of the whole that, you know, plays that part. So I think maybe we should thank our speaker.